Um, so first, um, I want to thank everybody for being here and for Farm Sanctuary for asking me to speak as I know the work that I do with Food Empowerment Project is a little bit different than the work that I've done in the past. Um, I also want to thank the young volunteer who is going to be um, doing my PowerPoint presentation for me as well as all the other staff of Farm Sanctuary and the volunteers who are making this event happen. I also have to admit to you that my talk is going to have to change today. And the reason why is because of maybe something many of you didn't hear about, maybe some of you did, but what happened yesterday in Charlottesville, Virginia. And that's that a KKK rally had taken place on Friday and protesting the dismantling of a Confederate emblem of some sort. And so yesterday, hundreds of activists, anti-racist activists protested and unfortunately, a white supremacist ran his car into these peaceful protesters. One young woman was killed, and two others died. Because I'm not around a lot of internet access right now, I'm unaware if the other two people died as a result of the car being drive, driven into the marchers and protesting the KKK, or in some other way. My understanding is some fighting has ensued there. Um, but I have to change my talk a little bit in adjustment to what's happened. And I have to admit to you, this is not something that shocks me. I know the hatred that there is in this country for people of color. And as a woman of color, I've experienced this myself. But what it does is it hurts my heart. And it makes me realize that I need to ask all of you to just let down some of your guard about some of the things I'm talking about. Sorry. <laughs> But the tragedies that are happening around us are some of the things we can control and we must take the responsibility and do what we can to lessen some of the suffering to human animals in our society as well. So my talk is going to be adjusted and you're going to see me skip some slides. I already deleted one and some other ones I'm going to go through. And I'm going to admit to you that if, you weren't, if this was not an animal audience, if most of you weren't getting this information from somewhere else, I would be going more in depth with the animal and the veganism part, but I am skipping and I'm, and I'm abbreviating that portion of my talk because of the fact that I know that you all are aware of this. Um, the reason why I started Food Empowerment Project is because of the need for those of us, especially people of color, that we don't want to leave a piece of us somewhere else. We, want it, we, we acknowledge and we embrace the injustices that are taking place against human and non-human animals together. We don't want to have to say we're vegans, therefore we're okay with racist analogies in the animal movement. We don't want to have to say we're women, therefore we're okay with sexist analogies if it furthers what happens um, to promote veganism. We believe in a way to combine these, to say I am a woman, I am a woman of color, and I'm a vegan. And I'm not going to sell anybody out in order to make this argument, because they're all important. <laughs> So you can, um, and I have to admit too, this, this, um, my husband Mark Hawthorne and I, I admit, so Gene's there, he can hear me, and Michelle can hear me, I skipped some of yesterday because I needed to have my bat batteries recharged. And what as I did is I went to Seneca Falls, which is where the women's rights movement, um, according to, uh, I have to admit, a white perspective, um, gained its, its notoriety. And this is where, again, from the white perspective, the first women's um, conference took place. And I went there, and it was an incredible experience, because to some degree, it was, it was kind of focusing on what I'm wanting to talk about here. And that the, one of the reasons why the women's rights movement was started is because you had women who were working very hard and very passionately as abolitionists against slavery. And when they traveled to London to be a part of the conversation about abolishing slavery, the first day of the conference that took place was against women's participation and not wanting women to have a voice in this fight. But the black women, the slaves in the United States, and the free slaves in the United States were also told, you can only talk about the slavery that's taking place against our people. You can't talk about women's rights. And so what ended up happening is this women's rights conference was started as a way to combine these issues. This concept of intersectionality isn't new to many people of color. It is something we've dealt with for a long time, that it's no if this or that, it's all of us. 
So this conference was started and um, the great um, hero of mine, Frederick Douglass, was there. And the reason why I love Frederick Douglass is because he, like so many people of color, recognized the various oppressions and fought against them together and didn't say this one is more important than that one. He said these are all important and we need to fight together. So I'm coming to you with that in order to start my presentation. So this is Joy. Um, she was rescued in a quote unquote meat factory um, in California. And I always like to show Joy or other animals because a lot of people when I do this work, I'm not coming to do these talks necessarily just to animal rights people because of the work that we do. But for me, Joy embodies why it is that veganism is one of the main tenets of the work that we do. And that's because Joy has a right to her body. Joy has a right to her fur, not people who wear fur. She has a right to the flesh on her body, not those who want to consume her. And she has a right not to be experimented on for those who want to make profit off of products that are tested on animals. Joy has every right to her own life. And that is why we are a vegan organization. And then what, that is why it's so important to us to talk about veganism and everything that it is that we do. This is Autumn, and she's another reason why um, we're a vegan organization. Um, Autumn lives at Vine Sanctuary. I'm sure some of you heard Patrice talk earlier. Um, but she lives at Vine, and she was a mama cow who had her babies taken away from her. As was stated in my introduction, I've done a lot of um, investigations of factory farms and slaughterhouses. And the reason why I like to always highlight um, cows who are raised for milk is because the whole myth of um, not only if you're just drinking their milk, they don't have to die, but also the fact that there are such things as quote unquote humane farms. There is no such thing as humane farms because mamas like Maddox constantly have their babies taken away from them. It doesn't matter how they're raised. They always have to take those babies away from their mamas because of the fact that they want to sell their milk. So this next slide, this is baby Maddox, who actually was a, a, a little calf who was taken away. Uh, Maddox also lives at Vine Sanctuary. Um, but what I'm going to play for you is um, audio from an investigation that was done in Georgia um, looking at cows in the dairy industry. And what you can hear when you're listening is a mama cow and her baby bellowing back and forth to each other after they've been separated. If you listen to my TEDx talk, you can hear, uh, you can hear a small sample of that because I use that sound in my talk. Um, go ahead and skip to the next one. This one, again, I'm going to, because fish, because there are no fishies here for everybody to hang out with, I think it's really important that we also remember fish um, who are killed and the fact that um, fish, the way that the, the country looks at fish is not as individuals. In fact, in, other animals are counted as individuals when you look at how many are raised and killed for food, but fish instead are counted in tonnage as if their individual lives don't matter. And I could tell you how smart fish are that some carp will stay away from hooks up to three years after being hooked. But for me, frankly, it's the fact that they can feel pain and that they're individuals to their own lives and that's all that matters to me, to not want to cause them pain. So I'm gonna, that was my veganism bit, which is very short, but I think y'all know. Um, so how many people here are familiar with the term environmental racism? few of you are. So basically this is one portion of the population is more negatively impacted by, neg by harmful pollutants and it predominantly occurs in communities of color. So um, New York City, um, which is where I got this, this isn't like, this happens all over the world. But basically um, in New York City, I guess you have areas that have um, the airplanes coming through with the diesel. You have a lot of trucks, you have a lot of depots, a lot of places in California, it's where you'll find our incinerators, where you'll find our um, toxic waste facilities. And it's predominantly people of color who are the most impacted. But it's the same when you look at factory farming, where you have a majority of the pig farms in North Carolina, um, in North Carolina, um, located where the black community lives as well as indigenous communities, where the people there experience nosebleeds because of the, the fact that they're living in such toxic environments, the fact that they can't open their windows in the summertime because of the flies, and the fact that their property value is so low because nobody wants to live next to one of these facilities. And as someone who's investigated um, pig farms in North Carolina, the smell is something that I can never bring to you. It is unbelievable. But the same takes place in California, 
where we have over 17,000 cows on dairy farms, where one dairy cow produces 120 pounds of wet manure per cow every day. This is where you have the majority of the Latinx population living because they work in the Central Valley and they experience some of the highest rates of asthma. But as a vegan organization, I could talk to you about slaughterhouse workers and factory farm workers, but instead Food Empowerment Project work wants to shine a light on maybe things that we don't think about so much, that we want to think and recognize and understandably as well that we are consuming a diet that doesn't include what the suffering that is happening to non-human animals. But the problem is it is we are consuming the suffering of what's happening to human animals and that's farm workers. Farm workers who pick our food, who die every year in the fields for the food that we eat. They're homeless. They live along the, the, camp, the water, on the riverways. And they're the ones, unless you grow all of your own food, you are eating food from a farm worker, picked by a farm worker, who sacrifices so much. Women who cross the border to get to the United States to do this work get on birth control pills because the fact that it's almost guaranteed that they're going to be raped as they cross the border. Sexual harassment is rampant in the fields, not to mention the type of work that these farm workers do. Um, it's also, um, I'll just talk briefly about the coalition of Immokalee workers. Uh, maybe some of you have heard about the boycotts against Wendy's. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but basically, they're just asking for one more penny per pound for the tomatoes that they pick. Simply one more penny per pound. So this is why when, when we as vegans talk about the fact that we eat a compassionate diet and a cruelty-free diet, I always want us to rethink that phrasing. Because it's not necessarily the case when you have farm workers who are dying in the fields, when you have farm workers who are homeless. In New York, there's a lot of actions. This one took place already. But there's a lot of actions happening here in the state of New York that you can advocate and use your voice to, to take up and, and stand in solidarity with the farm workers who pick our food. I'm gonna skip this slide. One of the things that Food Empowerment Project does is that we, um, we advocate for corporate campaigns that are called by farm workers themselves, and we also work to stop lead, bad policy against farm workers, which is the slide I just skipped on. But one of the other things we do is we do a school supply drive for the children of farm workers. Farm workers sacrifice everything for their children to have a better future. So what we do is we've been doing school supply drives for the children of farm workers for about four years now. And just this past Sunday, we were out delivering over 300 backpacks to the children of farm workers. When we arrived, there were over 300 farm workers wrapped around the block standing in line to receive these school supplies. Um, and I will admit to you, the next slide, is not from them. <laughs> we haven't gotten our pictures yet. It was literally just last week. But they were standing in the sun for hours and hours and hours as they waited for us to give them school supplies filled with notebook paper, pens, and pencils. Um, and we do this not as an act of charity, but we do this as instead as a way to thank them. There's an unjust and a broken and a corrupt system taking place. And we're simply doing our part to thank them as vegans, as everybody, for feeding all of us. We delivered over 461 backpacks over the past week. And these school supplies were donated primarily by vegans, because as a vegan organization, but also the Latinx community. And it has proven to be an incredible bond between us working on this effort together. Go ahead, let's go to the next one. I always can't decide between the girls and the boys, so I always have to put some girls and I always have to put the boys. Um, but they're all so cute. Um, we also did work um, where we did a um, day of solidarity for farm workers. And the event was entirely vegan because of our participation, because we could not participate unless the event was vegan. So all the farm workers were fed a 100% vegan meal, and the event took place entirely in Spanish, except for the word vegan. And um, I was able to speak to everybody about what happens to animals in factory farms. So again, as I mentioned before, we're asking people to boycott Wendy's. I don't care that they have a vegan burger, I really don't. The fact is, is that they are not paying farm workers one penny more per pound for the tomatoes that they pick. So we're asking people to respect those campaigns called by farm workers themselves. 
We're also asking for a boycott of Driscoll's berries because the farm workers in San Quentin, Mexico are asking us to because a lot of their rights are being violated. So one of the other areas, and this is something um, that again, where vegans say things are cruelty free and they're not, is that 70% of the world's cacao or chocolate comes from Western Africa, where some of the worst cases of slavery and child labor are taking place. So again, to me, if a chocolate bar has chocolate that's coming from Western Africa, except for a few exceptions, that is not cruelty free because it's at the sacrifice of children who are being used to cut cacao out of the cacao trees or bushes. Um, so how do these children get there? They get there in a variety of ways. One is that they are sold into it. Um, the Ivory Coast and Ghana are very close to Burkina Faso and Mali, which are very poor countries. So sometimes a family member will sell them into, to, into the industry. Other times the children go into these places thinking that they are going to get money and they're going to be able to bring it back to their families. And worse are the children who are actually kidnapped from marketplaces and um, forced into this industry. And here you have children who are trafficked hundreds of miles away who don't speak the, the local language at all. For me, this is the, I watched a documentary where a a former slave was asked, what would you say to Westerners who eat chocolate? And the slave, former slave said, tell them when they are eating chocolate, they are eating my flesh. And as a vegan, I knew that's the same thing as a non-human animal would be saying. And I knew I could never look at chocolate in the same way again. And so when Food Empowerment Project was started, I incorporated that into our work. So what happens to these, is somebody, what is my time? Because I know I have a lot more to do and I don't want to. I don't want to shortcut anybody, but I know I might have to. <laughs> oh, got plenty of time. Um, so how these children get there, I already explained. What they do in the work is they're using machetes, long, sharp objects, where you see children as young as seven years old cutting the cacao pods out of these trees. The children have, it's hard to see here, but she's got scars on her arms and her legs. And this is actually from a Rainforest Alliance certified farm. And this photo was taken in 2013. So this is still happening. In fact, in June 2015, over 48 children were liberated from slavery, 6 to 16 years old. So this isn't something that's maybe happening. This is something that is happening as we're in this room right now. So. Um, a lot of times these children are beaten if they don't move fast enough and worse, um, when they try to escape, many of them are beaten so severely um, that they don't survive. So what Food Empowerment Project did is we created a list of chocolates we do and do not recommend based on where the chocolate is coming from. We update this month, this monthly. Every month we add new companies to this list. Companies have to at least make one vegan chocolate in order to get on our list. So we are, companies actually reach out to us and say we want to be on your list and we have to check their website and we have to say sorry you don't have anything vegan. You can't make our list. Because this list is used by vegans and non-vegans alike. But what we have on there as well is an understanding of what happens to cows as well as goats in the industry. That we don't want suffering to happen to human or non-human animals for the chocolate industry. Our list doesn't go based on certifications. The, most of the certifications, if not all of them, have been found to be problematic. We go simply based on country of origin. Um, we do make some, some exceptions for worker-owned cooperatives. So our list is as transparent as possible, where we will tell you why we don't recommend a company. Um, if any of your favorite vegan companies are on the did not respond list or do not recommend list, we have worked with several companies to change their suppliers to where they're no longer buying from where this is taking place. We also have free apps that you can download. So if you have a Android, or an iPhone, you can download these apps for free because we want you to use these apps. Because frankly, if you're vegan, you, there is that compassion in you that says you don't want to cause suffering. And so we want to make it as easy as possible for you to do what we call eat your ethics. 
So the last part of the food justice areas that I'm going to talk about is the lack of access to healthy foods, which predominantly takes place in communities of color and low-income communities, except for maybe white populations living in the Appalachia area. And a lot of people refer to these as food deserts. We don't call these food deserts. Um, we find that term to be problematic. Um, you can go as far to call it food oppression or food apartheid. Both would be accurate. And what's happened in this country, but is what happened is in places around the world, that access to healthy food has become a privilege instead of a right, which it should be. Where our communities have higher rates of diabetes and other health problems because we do not have the same access to healthy foods as other communities do. This is a global issue. I've talked about it in New Zealand, where the Mori are the most impacted, the Can in Canada, where the First Nations people are impacted, and, the, and it tends to be people of color and indigenous populations who are the most impacted. And again, it's no surprise that it takes place here in New York, and the only example I could find that was concise enough was in what's taking place in New York City. So what Food Empowerment Project has done is that, you know, I went vegan over 30 years ago, and I'm not 27, as you can tell. Um, I went vegan in Texas in the 80s. I actually went vegetarian when I was in elementary school in the 70s. Um, but my family didn't have a lot of money. So I wasn't able to stick with being vegetarian. We, I had to eat what people brought to us, which meant I couldn't be vegetarian. So I had to give up being vegetarian. And I want everybody to be able to meet their ethics. I want everybody who loves animals and doesn't want to contribute to their suffering like I did to be able to have that option. But everybody doesn't have that option because of the fact of the food and the way it is in these communities. So Food Empowerment Project has made this one of the main pieces of our work. And a lot of people say this isn't vegan advocacy because we aren't just talking about farmed animals. But it is vegan advocacy in the lens of a woman of color. A woman who has experienced this herself and doesn't want others to experience this as well. So our work um, we did, I, I moved to San Jose, California, which some of you may have heard is Silicon Valley. It was known as the Valley of Heart's Delight. This is where Cesar Chavez got his organizing start. But it's also an area of incredible wealth. And where I worked downtown and where I lived downtown, I had two liquor stores across the street from each other. And I wondered, in this area of incredible wealth, am I living in one of these areas where healthy food is not accessible for everyone? So this was when I was still working full time at the other nonprofit. And we gathered up all of our volunteers and we surveyed high income areas and low income areas in Santa Clara County to determine if the lack of access to healthy foods um, was dependent upon the color of their skin as well as their income level. And what we found was indeed it was. It wasn't anything shocking, right? We knew that it was gonna be, but what happens is people want numbers. Policymakers want numbers. Foundations want numbers. So we wanted to give them the numbers that we knew existed. We found that high income areas had 14 times more access to frozen vegetables than communities of color and low income communities did. That meat and dairy alternatives were pretty much non-existent as were organic foods. So after doing this work, presenting this work to policymakers who, uh, this is the wonderful thing, is we had the mayor helping us, we had the, the board of supervisors helping us, we had an assembly member helping us, all knowing we were a vegan organization, but they didn't care. They knew the work we were doing was important. We submitted our report to all of them, and then we knew, we knew we didn't want to make the mistake that other organizations have made in the past, and that's that they go into communities of color in other communities and they tell them what they think they should have. And this is a fear that I have that the vegan movement does as well, is that they go into these communities that they don't belong to and start talking to them about what they need instead of listening to the community about what their needs truly are. We follow environmental justice principles. We don't go into communities unless we're asked to. That's the foundation of what it is that we do. So what we did then is we went out and we did focus groups. We did three focus groups in San Jose, all conducted in Spanish, to determine what the community's needs were and what the community's barriers were. This is just a photo of how we did these focus groups in San Jose. And what we found was we had communities who were predominantly immigrants. So you had people who ate healthier in their native countries than they did here in the United States. 
because they could access fresh tomatoes where they lived because they grew them themselves. But when they came to the United States, the only place where they could access things like tomatoes was to actually buy tomato sauce, which, which as the convenience stores would sell. And they didn't want to cook with that. That was just, they did not want to be a part of that, but they were given no choice. They actually were from a healthier eating background than they were when they came here. We also found that some of them, oops, sorry, it's the next one. We also found that some of them had vegan kids who they weren't quite sure how to feed them. They didn't know what to give them. So even though we're talking about some of the most impacted of the population in San Jose, which is where the most, um, the poorest of the communities were in the county, um, they did have vegan children who wanted to stick with veganism but were having difficulties. But the, one of the biggest barriers that they faced wasn't necessarily just the proximity that these peoples had to grocery stores or growing their own food. It was the cost of the food. It was the simple cost was just too much. So this is when Food Empowerment Project decided there was something that everybody could do to help this issue. And that's that we need to start supporting and advocating for living wages across the board. <clears throat> I'm glad people support that. I always feel like it's so controversial for vegans to talk about advocating for, non -hum for human animals. But basically, think about it this way. You're still advocating for non-human animals, right? Because you're basically saying, I want more people to be able to eat healthy. They're going to need more money to do it. It's going to help the animals when that takes place. But at the end of the day, for me, it's about justice. It's, an, it's obscene what people are being paid. Um, I'm not just talking about those who work in the animal movement. I'm talking about other people too. Um, these people aren't making, you know, living wages. People talk about, well, if they have a budget. We're talking about communities who don't have budgets. Budgets are a luxury. We're talking about people, you know, I worked, I wrote a blog, if you ever want to look at it, it's not the, not the nicest blog to read. But I had to work fast food. Again, my family didn't have a lot of money. I was vegan and I was working in a fast food burger place. And if you know anything about working in fast food, then you need to realize it was pretty unbearable for me. Not just that I had to do this to make money for my family, but also that I was a vegan. But there is no budgeting when you don't know what your schedule is going to be like the next week. You don't know if you're going to say something to upset the manager and they're going to cut your hours that week or they're going to make you work 60 hours the next week. There is no budget for a lot of people. So what we can do is we can advocate for living wages across the board. Food Empowerment Project worked in Sonoma County to get a living wage ordinance passed. We, what, we go out and we step out every time Walmart workers protest. Doesn't matter if they're restaurant workers, fast food workers, we need to be advocating for a living wage for everyone because it's better for everyone. So we're currently doing our work in Vallejo, California, which is not too far from San Francisco or Berkeley. And the reason why we're doing our work there is because one of the founding members of the Black Panther Party asked us to take a look at that community and see what was taking place there. And what we did is we built amazing alliances with other community members. And again, the guy from the David Hilliard from the Black Panther Party is not vegan. And I said, I hope you understand that we're a vegan group. Everything we do is going to be with a vegan lens. We're not really going to be looking at if meat and milk are going to be available. We're going to be looking at simply alternatives. And he was like, that's totally fine. I know it's better for everybody anyway. This isn't that much of a hang up as people might think that it is. At the end of the day, people know. And what these community want, they want fruits and vegetables. That's what they want. So we did our work here in Vallejo, which is currently ongoing. What we did is we surveyed um, every establishment in the town. The town is in a very white rural community, but Vallejo itself is one of the most diverse cities in the United States. High black, Latinx, and um, Filipino community members. And so we did our surveying there of every establishment, convenience store, grocery store, gas station. And what we found was that 88% of all the liquor stores um, were in the low income neighborhoods. That there is a liquor store for almost over 2,700 residents in the community. That the availability of quote unquote meat and dairy alternatives is pretty much non-existent. If you click over the next two, that's fine. So that only about 17% of the stores even had a dairy alternative. And the reason why we focus on this so much, for, first and foremost, is because of the cows. 
because as I, we all know, they shouldn't have to go through what they go through. They shouldn't have their babies taken away. But there's also a recognition that colonization is what changed the diets of many of us who are people of color. And that when Columbus came over and he destroyed our way of life, our, the indigenous community in Mexico, I'm a very proud um, uh, Mexican. Um, what he did to our communities and our livelihoods is he introduced, they introduced, the colonizers introduced meat, that's why, I'm sorry, dairy, cows in general, cows and goats. So that's why a lot of us who are people of color, we can't digest lactose because it's not normal for our bodies to do so. It's just not what we were meant to do. But what's weird is that we're the ones being called lactose intolerant. When at the end of the day, we simply aren't digesting the milk of another species. So it's really the other white Eurocentric people who are what, not normal. <laughs> so as my husband Mark Cawthorn helped us coin, we are people of color, people who can't digest the milk of another species into adulthood, we're lactose normal. That's just it. The onus is predominantly put on people of color that there's something wrong with us. There's nothing wrong with us in that. So, so one of the things um, we found in doing this work is that a corporation was responsible for some of the barriers of accessing healthy food in communities. And that was Safeway. I, I should mention, I've got some leaflets up here. Um, what Safeway did is they were based in downtown Vallejo and they moved from downtown Vallejo to a more expensive area, a, a more a suburban area in the community. When they left that downtown location, they put a restrictive deed on that property preventing any other grocery store from moving in for 15 years. So for 15 years, senior citizens, young children, didn't even know what it was like to have a grocery store in their community. This didn't take just place here. Washington, D.C. has constantly been passing for years now. They did it there, too. Constantly passing what they can do, because they're kind of also governed by Congress, the best of their ability to prevent this from happening there again. We know this happened in Colorado as well. This is happening all across the United States. We have a petition on our website that we're asking everybody to sign. If you have a safe way in your community, please take one of these leaflets and talk to us, because we really, this is, this is reprehensible. It's absolutely unjustified that a corporation is responsible for impacting the health of communities and we will not let this rest. I had a communication with the vice president at, at Safeway where he told me sometimes it's necessary. I told him it was never necessary to impact the health of the health of a community. So this is an ongoing campaign that we have against them. So I'm going to show this slide and I know it's blurry, but when I took the picture, the woman said, are you taking pictures in here? And I said, no, of course not. <laughs> But I have to show this slide because to me it's indicative of what I want everybody who says it's easy to be vegan. This is what I want you to see when you, every time you're about to say that to somebody. Because what you have here are potatoes, onions, and a couple of bananas. Boy, it looks even blurrier up there. Um, this is all that some communities have. Because this is all that's going to be available at the liquor store. And this is a good one. This one that actually has produce. So, yeah, this is where the vast majority of people get their foods in these communities, is from liquor stores, convenient. They masquerade as convenience stores. The, the, the obscene thing is there's this thing, and I can get on this whole other tangent, called NAICS, and NAICS is the one who allows these people to decide what they want to be called. So a place like this can call themselves a grocery store, because according to NAICS, no one's going to check in on you to make sure it really is. So that's how you have two liquor stores across the street from each other because they're considered grocery stores. They label themselves as such. So when we're talking about it's easy to be vegan, this, isn't, this, this is how it is for a lot of communities of color in our country. It's not that easy to be vegan for everybody. All you have to do as a vegan, all you have to do is say, you know, for most people, or it's easy to be vegan if you have access to healthy foods. That's, it's not changing anything you do as an activist. Just be cognizant. About if you're, in a, if you're talking to a whole community and you say that and there's somebody there who lives in one of these communities, that's gonna, you're, they're going to think nothing you say is true. So why, why let, allow that to discredit us? Let's be honest about it. It's okay. It's not, you know, we, can, we can help that. Let's just be honest about it. 
Now obviously these are things we want to see. This is also in Vallejo and this is a, a grocery store that's owned by a Latinx family. Um, and we're excited about, thank you. Um, so Food Empowerment Project, we work with the Vallejo People's Garden. Um, we also are, we just had a wonderful meeting with the mayor of Vallejo, who again, they love us. They know we're vegan. He says something like, you know, the whole, I don't even want to say, I usually say killing um, two hunters with one bullet, but I think other people say things like, that are different than that, but they'll make that type of analogy and I'll be like, hey, there's a vegan in the room. They're like, all right, Lauren, I'm sorry. Or they'll talk about eating something. So they're cognizant that there's vegans in the room and they adjust what they're talking about and I have to remind them. But we had this amazing meeting with the mayor of Vallejo and um, we're gonna bring, work together to bring worker-owned cooperatives to the community. And that's because it's something that we feel strongly about. Not everybody can grow their own food. I'm somebody who's lived in an apartment my entire life. I've never owned land. Not that I'm sure that I would ever want to, but it's not something that I've ever had the ability to do. Not everybody has that luxury. But what we need to do is we need to bring worker-owned cooperatives where people in the community are making the money and the money isn't going back to Arkansas with the Walmart family. We want the community keeping that money in their own lives teaching skills. So the mayor is going to be helping us. We're going to work together. He's also helping us to find plots of land in Vallejo, which the city will investigate, to start more urban gardens. So we have the city working with us to make all of this possible. We also have the city support. We do what's called the Vallejo Healthy Food Fest. We did our second one this year, where we serve culturally appropriate foods all day long, all vegan, and everybody gets in for, everybody who lives in the community gets in for free. We serve vegan food the entire day from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. All day long, vegan food is coming out. And um, this past one we did was, on, was in July, July 16th. I remember because these are really traumatic for me because I'm not really into events like that. But we had um, vegan um, chicken adobo. I don't know if anybody here is Filipinx, but um, that was a huge treat to the Filipinx community to be able to have vegan adobo. Um, we also had, we had Mexican food, we had greens, um, we just had food all day long for the community. And the other thing we had was um, culturally appropriate um, performers as well. So for a lot of people, this is their first vegan event. We had over 400 people attend. Um, last year we had over 300 people attend, over 200 from, thing is we don't want to be into vegans coming to these events, right? No offense. These events are for the community and most of the people in the community don't even have access to, to soy milk. So, and we have people hold up signs like this because I'm pretty sure everybody's had a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So I don't like to say this is my first vegan meal because I want them to realize veganism is also just a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So we have things like, this is my first vegan event. So um, yeah, you can just like that. This is late Vejo's People Garden that we work with. And then we have our culturally, our performances. Um, which we had um, dancers, fol folklorico dancers as well. We also did focus groups in Vallejo. We did five focus groups in Vallejo, different than in San Jose because the community is different, right? Every community is different. What way work in San Jose is not going to work in Vallejo. So we had these five different, every single one we had vegan food. And we have a video which we'll be putting up with one of the women being, who just recently went from being homeless to having a place to live, talking about her vegan plate and how much she loved the vegan food. We had senior citizens who had the vegan food who were asking our chef to start providing the vegan food for their book club at the senior center. That were so excited about all the vegan food that they were eating. And that's all that it took was just delicious vegan food and saying, we want to hear from you. What are your barriers? So now we're working within the community to start making some of these positive changes happen so that people can have access to healthy foods, which of course will include um, animal alternatives. So things you can do. Obviously, everybody can get number one. Um, number two is lend your voices to the needs of farm workers. So again, if you live here in New York, if you live in North Carolina, there's a lot of farm worker efforts going on. Just asking you to plug into those, make that call, send that email, whatever they're asking you to do. Um, buy organic when you can. It doesn't mean that the farm workers are treated any better. Just like those of us, when someone is like, I drink organic milk, we're like, well, it doesn't help the cow. Same thing with farm workers, right? But at least for the humans, it means one less bad thing is happening to them. They're not being doused with agricultural chemicals. Um, 
check out our chocolate list. Again, we have the list on our website. It's updated every month. If there's a vegan company that you like that's not on the list, email us our name. We'll reach out to them. Um, speak out about the issues of food injustices. This includes things such as um, reports will come out about communities of color that have high rates of diabetes and they'll be like, those people don't want to eat healthy. Dispel that myth. People don't have access to those healthy foods and we need to be talking about it. Um, support all living wages, sign up for our e-alerts, now I'm going to speed up really quickly, go ahead. So all of this is on our website, foodispower.org. It's available in English and in Spanish. We have all the animals, all the different ways they're raised and killed for food, including like lobsters and everybody like that. Um, we also have um, information about coffee. Next one, bananas. We also have veganmexicanfood.com, um, which is in English and in Spanish. And that website is gonna be relaunched if I'm, you know, if anybody here has ever done a website, you're like, it's going to be relaunched um, in time for Mexican Independence Day, which is September 16th. And it's going to look all fancy, and you're going to look at it, and you're going to be like, that must make Lauren uncomfortable. It does. It's like way fancier than I'm used to. I'm still old school. I still have a Blackberry, okay? That's how old school I am. And I love my Blackberry. Um, so I think you can go to the next one. So I'm just going to leave you with this. So. What we try to do is ask people to be responsible and think more critically about where your food choices are coming from. It's a local and a global responsibility. I know this talk can be really overwhelming and I know I did it really fast and there's a lot more I could say, but if you can look at it as opportunities, opportunities to eat your ethics, opportunities to expand your own circle of compassion. And also look at it as a way to improve and change the world around us. And I just wanna end really quickly with back to that um, women's rights museum that I went to. When I talk about a lot of the things that, that, that I talk about, I'm not asking vegans to give up their fight for, for the animals. I'm definitely not. The animals need all of us. What I'm asking for is us to try and be a little bit more consistent in our own ethics and what it is that we do. Not buy chocolate that comes from slavery. I mean, I don't even, it's hard to believe that I actually have to say that, but it's true. If you see people, companies promoting it, talk to other people about it. And when I looked back at the museum, sorry, I'm going a little bit. I think one of the coolest things about it was the bulk of the museum was about women's rights and what women went through and what their lives were like. But because the women of that day and the people who were involved in that movement, just as much a part on the outskirts, was the abolition of slavery. And that's because they weren't saying it's one or the other. And I think that our movement, I would be so proud to look back in 100 years, 200 years, and if there is a museum to the fight that we've made for non-human animals, that there's something there talking about the fact that we didn't ignore the tragedies of the world around us today, and that we also fight to put those as part of our work. Thank you.